Hi folks, thanks for tuning back in to the channel. Today's video is going to be part two of our two-part series of my first use of force with TDCJ at the Styles unit. Our last video ended with me looking over from patting down an offender to seeing an offender on top of Captain Boykins and assaulting him. Now, there were a lot of different ways that I could have reacted to this. I could have looked at the center picket boss, yelled out there's an assault going on, let her put out the broadcast, and there would have been help on the way. Wouldn't have done Captain Boykins any good at that point because he's being attacked. I could have run over to the side, secured his keys, secured his radio, attempted to knee strike the offender. They didn't teach knee strikes in the academy, however... Marine Corps, Coast Guard, we are taught those. That's part of your self-defense tactics for if somebody happens to be attacking your partner. That didn't come to mind at the time. I could have run over and dropped an elbow, like I'm WWE wrestler, on top of the offender. Anything. So many different things that I could have done. I could have taken out my pepper spray and sprayed the offender. That also would have gotten all over Captain Boykins. What do I do? Probably the most boneheaded thing that I could have done. I don't know if it was something out of a movie or what I was thinking. I just remember looking over and seeing the offender on top of Captain Boykins with his leg bent. I take off running. I don't remember how far away they were from me. It, it might have been about 20 feet. I didn't have full speed when I started running and I ended up Superman diving on top of them. Yes. Offenders on top of the captain and to um, help things out, I Superman dive on top of the offender. I'm not saying this to say that this was the best decision that I could have made. There were probably worse decisions. The worst decision would have been to do nothing. If an assault's going on and a CO is standing there doing nothing, my opinion, I'm sorry if this gets dislikes, you were worthless. You don't need to be in the job. If there's an assault between an offender and a corrections officer going on and you're there, you respond to it. You're there to protect that individual's life and vice versa. Now, enough of the moaning drone. So, I take off running. And I Superman dive on top of the offender. Yeah. I don't know if I thought I was going to magically make this stop. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I was in shock that the captain was being attacked. And I made probably one of the dumbest decisions that I could have. So, once I land on top of them, all you can hear is grunts and groans. There's this phenomenon known as auditory exclusion. Auditory exclusion is where you're involved in a situation, something of high stress, possibly a fight, and somebody next to you is talking to you. They may even be yelling at you. And because everything that's going on in your head, you physically cannot hear what they're saying. It's just not registering. It takes something else to get your attention. Something has to break that sensation usually some kind of physical contact, a bump, a really loud yell to kind of draw your attention because you're just not hearing what's what's going on around you. It's very akin to tunnel vision. After I land on top of the two of them, the offender at this point no longer wants anything to do with Captain Boykin. He's ready to deal with me. Once I landed on top of him, my force carried us on over. The problem with that was the offender ended up on top of me. There wasn't enough force for us to do a full 360 roll with me on top of the offender. It was 180. Now the offender's on top of me. To this day, I can remember his face. I didn't know it at the time. I won't say what his name is. However, I do remember his name. His face was pretty well beat up. His nose, if anybody's ever seen the movie Raging Bull, 
His nose looked like Robert De Niro. Was it Robert De Niro? No, it wasn't Robert De Niro. I don't remember the actor's name. His face is coming to me. Oh, it'll come to me at another time. Y'all can laugh at me for getting his name wrong, but the actor in Raging Bull, oh, the, the way the nose was, it was just smashed. The thing that I remember the most, the guy's teeth, most of his teeth were missing. There was just a tooth here and there. I didn't know this at the time. That is a sign of a fighter. That's a sign of an offender who's been involved in so many fights. His teeth have been knocked out of his head from all those fights. And that was this guy. As he's on top of me, he's got his hands in the same way, trying to pin me down. And his face is... It seemed like it was just inches away from mine. I remember him snarling, trying to bite at me, trying to snap at me, spitting at me, just speaking in a language I had never heard before, speaking in tongues. I'm pretty sure I was saying stuff. What TDCJ teaches you to say is, offender, stop resisting, offender, stop assaulting me. I highly doubt those were the words that I was saying. It was probably something more akin to you dirty him and it's going to go from there because I'm not going to use that language on YouTube. You can imagine what I would have been saying. I remember having my hands up underneath me and I'm trying to push the offender up off of me. So I've got his elbows on me. I'm trying to push him off of me. I'm doing everything I can to try to roll left and right with my feet. Again, the academy did not teach proper ground tactics. Problem with that was being untrained, you're going to go with what your training is. And if you have none, you're just going to react to something. So that's all we were doing. It was not very effective. It felt like we were fighting for at least a minute, maybe even two minutes. In reality, it might have been all of about 15 to 20 seconds. Fights always seem like they take longer than they do just because of the adrenaline rush that you have going on. The next thing that I know, there's a body on top of us, and then another body, and then another body. At this point, I'm blacked out because now the offender is completely crushed up against me. I can't hear. I can barely breathe. In my mind, I'm thinking other offenders have piled on top of us. I might be dead. In reality, what had happened was the center boss saw what was going on. She put out the proper broadcast. Officer needs assistance, B-side chow hall. Officer needs assistance, B-side chow hall. And from that point, every corrections officer at that unit that was not locked into a building, a picket, or a dorm, come running. I didn't see them, but they got there probably the fastest that they could have. There were so many of them, they may as well have been spy rigging and repelling from the rooftops. They all piled on top of us, and I'm not saying this is right. They're there to break up the fight, and that's it. What actually happens, this is your time to get your licks in. This is the time when you can get shots in on an offender that you normally couldn't get on. Now we're trying to break up a fight between a CO and an offender. There's going to be some extra shots taken. I know there were. I'm not going to say what or how. I just know that there were some receipts handed out for his behavior. You'll hear the term called handing out receipts for excessive force. At some point, they get the offender off of me. I'm laying on the ground. Somebody helps me up into a seated position. I'm laying on concrete. My button-up shirt is ripped all the way down. I've got blood, spit, spittle all over me. Uh, I looked like a mess. Three officers had the inmate restrained. Eventually, some hand restraints were put on the guy, hands behind his back. 
He was stood up. I got helped up to my feet. It was me, another corrections officer, and a sergeant. We start making our way toward medical. I had to go with him because I was the officer that had been assaulted. So, we're making our way to medical, and the sergeant is talking to the offender. I don't remember what he's saying. There's some kind of a script that gets read to every offender that's involved in a use of force. Uh, it covers a lot of legal responsibilities, the wrong that they had done. I wish I could remember the words of it, but there was just so much going on. I, I, I was on autopilot. Uh, I'm a freaking sweaty, bloody mess. My shirt's ripped up. I got my hand on this freaking offender, and I'm walking him. One thing I do remember about the offender, my hand on his arm, felt like I had my hand on a metal post. This guy was just solid. And I'm not saying that to be any kind of nice to the guy, but this dude was tough. You, you could tell just from that. We end up going to medical. We get to the back, and there's a shower that the offender gets put in. It's put in the shower, it's bars, turns. We go to take the handcuffs off, and he pulls away. He jerks forward, runs into the wall, says something to the nature of, no, no, you're not taking these hand restraints off of me. Uh-uh, no, and just goes on from there. Don't know why he didn't want the handcuffs taken off. For some reason, he just didn't. Sergeant asks the offender, does he want any kind of medical attention? Nope, he doesn't want medical attention. He wants the door to open so he can keep doing what he's doing to this. Profane word, profane word, profane word from there. Guy wanted to kill me at that point. I could tell just from looking at him. So, from that point, we left him in the cell. The nurses had come in. The CO that supervised medical had come in there, and I went away with the sergeant to one of the break rooms, fill out my statement for my use of force. Write down everything that I could remember that had happened, just the facts, no opinions, write all that down. And as I'm walking through, as I'm going past, I remember COs patting me on the arm, patting me on the back, slapping me on the back of the leg, you know, good game kind of thing. Day two rookie, first fight, came out a win. It's good stuff. I didn't feel like a hero. It it was it was bad. It, it should have never happened. And it wasn't so much because the use of force was done to the offender. It was that I had saved Captain Boykins. What had happened? This offender. He knew Captain Boykins from some point in the past. I don't know how long he had been in the system. I don't know how long Captain Boykins had worked there, but he knew him from some point and he didn't like him. This guy was classified improperly. I would find this out way later on that a lot of offenders had been improperly classified. He should have been in segregation. He should have never been in population. When he saw Captain Boykins, he knew this was his time to attack, and he did. What had happened as he's walking past Captain Boykins, he sees me already patting somebody down, that's his time to attack. He grabs Captain Boykins in a bear hug and twists him, so here they are, grabs him, twists him 90 degrees, and pushes him. When he fell, the leg I told you about that was bent and crooked up, his leg stayed in place while his body turned and he fell over backwards. Broke his leg at the knee. The knee was snapped. Leg was completely useless at that point. His other leg, I, I don't know. The reason the guy was trying to spit and snarl, he was HIV positive. These guys that are like this, they know that. They'll mix up all kinds of concoctions. It's called chunking. They'll put blood, urine, feces, any kind of bodily fluid that they can and try to throw it on a staff member or another offender. At this point, he's trying to spit and bite, just trying to get any kind of bodily fluids on 
try to spread his disease around. That's very common in places with offenders that have communicable diseases like that. So, the guy was eventually properly classified and moved into segregation. I would again deal with him multiple times because I worked in segregation from there and he was never pleasant to deal with. So after the assault, filled out my paperwork, went to unit laundry, turned that shirt in, got a new shirt issued to me, reported to the FTO. By this point, she had known what was going on. One of her OJTers had been involved in assault, had to get with her, give her the brief of what had gone on, fill out more paperwork. From this point, now it's time to go to medical, get checked out. Because of HIPAA laws, they couldn't tell me that he was HIV positive. I would find this out through the grapevine later on. Ran a couple of tests on me, drew some blood work, treated me for a few minor injuries, and that was it. Normal day in the office, went home from there, came back to work the next morning. Folks, I really hope you all enjoyed this video. I hope you take something back from it. It's a dangerous profession. Assaults can happen at any time to anybody, and it's usually going to happen when you don't see it coming. Stick around. Stay tuned. I got a lot more content that I can't wait to get out to you guys. Hope everyone enjoyed the video. Take care of yourselves. Have a great day.